what does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hapnas, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is a returning guest, Jan Jules, a fellow podcast host of the First Time Facilitators podcast. And we are jamming about facilitation and diving deep into what it means to facilitate audio-only sessions. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes to download my free one-page summary. And now, enjoy. Leanne. Miriam, welcome. hello. Hello, welcome back to the show. It's so good to be back. Every opportunity to chat to you is a is an awesome one. Yes, yes. And just uh, following your journey and the first time facilitator in 200 episodes. Well, it was 200. I thought I was going to stop, but I just have this, maybe it's separation anxiety, but I just keep sort of replaying old episodes and trying to keep it alive every week, which is so funny because I made a big deal of saying goodbye and then I thought, ah, I just want to keep publishing. So there we go. (laughs) It's difficult to stop, right? And to close. Yeah, especially when you don't have something to replace it. True. So looking back to the 200 episodes, you called it the first time facilitator back then um, because you started calling yourself facilitator. What has changed? And are you still calling yourself a facilitator today? Oh, I don't call myself a facilitator today. But a lot has, so that means a lot has changed, right? So 200 episodes ago, that was probably about 210-ish weeks of, because I was was putting it out a publish, uh, a podcast episode every week. So when when I started it, I was working internally. I was sent just around the world running leadership programs. I had no idea what I was doing. So, and I listened to podcasts and just couldn't find anything out there. So that's why I started the podcast, essentially to scratch my own itch, because it gave me the opportunity to chat to much more experienced facilitators around the world and ask them how they do it, much the same as you, Miriam, like just to find some inspiration. Um, And I don't know, you might share this as well. What was fascinating about that is being a podcast host and the parallels between that and facilitation, I find are very similar. And so in my first few, well, I think 10 or 20 episodes, I was very scripted, much like my facilitation game was more like a training role. It was scripted. It had like between 10.01 and 10.02, you do this activity and say this. You know, and then as I progressed through the facilitation podcast, episode 100, and that timeline with my facilitation career, I became much more looser with what I was doing. I had a framework and a structure, but I was looser. I think that was a graduation that really occurred. Although I I will say hey to Tim Ferguson, who's been a guest on your show. I know he listens all the time. He he said to me one day, he goes, when do you ever stop calling yourself a first-time facilitator? Because (laughs) you never run the same workshop. Like it's the different environment, different context, yes. different audience, different yeah. time of day. And so I guess there's a part of me that's always part of first time facilitator, but right now I'm looking at bringing facilitations to like the, the tools of facilitation into more consulting type of roles. So that's been the journey. Oh, wonderful. So it's more the facilitative leadership and facilitative project facilitation, for instance. Well, it's just a skill set you can use all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think There's a great book I read, uh, we uh, talk about foundational book that just completely shifted the way I think about things. It's called The The Courage to Be Disliked. Uh, It's a Japanese Mm. book. And the fundamental theme of the book is that all problems are interpersonal problems. Yeah. And if you think about it, yes, you see it all around you. So facilitation is about group dynamics and people. And so it's the ultimate tool for, for any work that you do. So thank goodness I've got that as a base. Yeah, I was just thinking about it when you said you're always a first-time facilitator because even if the time of the day and you are the same and the group is the same, the group dynamics will be different because, yes, they're the individuals of the group, but then there's this additional entity, which is just the dynamic between all these individuals. And there only must be one person who had a bad day. And whoop, everything, or you and had whoop. a bad day. Yeah, yeah. And everything is different. Absol- Everything's different. And it sounds really corny, Miriam, but like I did, I was going for a run the other day. I listened to the Nike running coach sometimes. And he was saying it was was part of this headspace run. And he said, every run that you do is a once in a lifetime run. Mm. And we always say that phrase once in a lifetime for something amazing and magnificent. But I reflected on it. I thought, yes, I'm running the same track, you know, in lockdown, I could only run the same sort of 5k route, but 
everyone was different. Every run was a once in a lifetime run. So every moment, every workshop is once in a lifetime. I love that. And it's also, everyone is so unpredictable. It's the same route. It's often the same weather, often the same time of the day. And sometimes I wait, I started running again, finally, last year. I saw that. Well done. Thank you. And there are days there, I think, oh, today is going to be amazing. And then I have no form. And other days where I think, let's see whether I can reach the next corner. And I don't stop running. So it's um, mm. also this, I think that's also a facilitation mindset to be okay with what is and what comes up. And then to accept, oh, I thought that I was in top form. Apparently I'm not. So now do I want to continue running or do I want to turn around? Everything is okay, but just take a decision and go with it, right? That's and run it. With it. Just make, <laughs> yeah, just make, and run with it. There you go. Look at these beautiful metaphors coming through. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I agree. It's uh, the running metaphor is very powerful. And also just the, you know, being around in space and getting lost in your thoughts sometimes. I think that, that was my, you know, in terms of just getting ready for a workshop. I love to run beforehand just to sort of clear the decks of what's going on in my mind so I can be present. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned with the scripting, the parallel between podcasting and workshop preparation. And I experienced the same before. I mean, I still sent my, my sample questions. And I ask them less and less and still have the impression that there is something about preparing these questions. So still, I would not walk into a workshop totally unprepared. So yes, maybe not scripted, but not unprepared. So mm -hmm. where do you see the difference and where do you draw the line? I'm much like you because with in terms of sending out prep questions, but I'll even say to guests, look, here, here's the type of question that I might ask you as part of the show. But I use it more as a primer for them to go, mm -hmm. all right, so, okay, so they're getting the headspace of this, these are the, the audience, this is this kind of slant that we want. And very often I might ask out of the 10 questions or eight, I might ask, you know, one or two, like the, the first one traditionally just to help them get comfortable with the show and the format so they get lost in the conversation. But yeah, apart from that, it doesn't really serve a purpose at all. Some people like, and it, what I find interesting as well, we both interview facilitators. I wonder if I have some guests that like, no, Leanne, I don't read the questions beforehand. And then others are like, they, you can tell, tell that they're reading notes and their bullet points. And it just shows like, because we talk to facilitators, just that the range of different styles. And so what's so fascinating is you'd think after 200 episodes, you'd establish, okay, this is a type of facilitation. This is, you know, in terms of the way people show up, but the diversity in this space is so glorious and there's space for everyone to participate as and take on that role of facilitator. I find that pretty cool. Yeah, so true. Some even sent me their replies back and I was like, no, 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 I don't want to see your answer no, no, because I, otherwise I'm, I'm not curious anymore. Yes. yes, and yes. Also, all the groups are different. So there are some who really want to see the agenda beforehand and if they're not seeing it, they're freaking out. I had it the other day that I said, well, I, I first have to interview the participants before I even start thinking of an agenda because, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what happens between the, the spaces and what is true for you and what is true for the group. And while I was conducting the interviews and she was right, at some point the client sent me their agenda draft. Oh, <laughs> we were thinking you could do this. And I realized, hmm, either you don't have enough to do or I'm not expensive enough. But it still re leaves this room for micromanagement. And I thought this um, was also showing so much about different clients and also the culture of a group. Totally. It, it really does. And there's a lot of discussion sometimes, and I'm a bit, I'm quite strong on this <laughs> when it comes to even the technology platforms that you use with a client, because we, we all know the difference now between Zoom and Teams and like jumping onto a Google call, right? And so my preference, I think the best you can use is Zoom. So a client will come to me and go, we need to use Teams and I will influence right back. And I will tell them, no, we're not using Teams. I've got a Zoom account, I've got a Zoom producer, and this is how we're going to run it for the best experience, of course, to meet your objectives. But I also find, I mean, and this is really the balance between, it's probably power and perception of power as well. Um, a, a lot of facilitators that I know in, my, in jumping on the Facebook community, they 
will say, you know, I've been told I have to use it teams and I can't influence back. And I sort of question like, really? Like, or did you just not try? And so it's really interesting, the dynamic you were talking about in terms of them creating an agenda for you. And it, it, it constantly plays out. There's sometimes a bit of tension. And I think yeah. we're just going to see ourselves partners and trust our knowledge as the expert of the group process, right? And yeah. owning that, that's where we add the value. Yeah, it was indeed very interesting. And we had the same Teams versus Zoom discussion oh, because Zoom very often is blocked by big corporates still because they had one glitch at the beginning of the pandemic and now it's still blocked. So we jumped on Butter. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. I got to learn Butter over the weekend and it solved all the problems. And it was the nice thing was that it added a little bit of excitement. It's like a team outing. So you're going to a different space that you're usually used to. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Really like even when when people on teams jump onto Zoom, they're like, whoa, this is like just the seamless breakouts and all the stuff, yeah. the cool stuff that you can do with it. Yeah, I agree. It's like a, even though you're in the same four walls, it's a different experience because you're of a new platform. That's great. And I'll, what I find interesting is also how you have to adjust or you can observe behavioral patterns. So on Butter, you have to raise the hand in order to queue up when you have an idea or you want to say something, something that you wouldn't do on Zoom. Maybe everyone raised their hand, but it's a different dynamic. Different yeah. etiquette. Mm. And I loved how you reflected about the power dynamics and the facilitator's mindset, also how confident you became in pushing back to your clients, saying, no, that's how we do it for the best of your experience, because you can trust me. You hired me and therefore you can trust me. And in the context of you not ca calling yourself a facilitator anymore. So what comes after being a facilitator? This is the beginning of the, the next chapter of the story, Miriam. I just said to you, and just before we jumped on, I randomly, I booked a trip to Las Vegas next week. And that's really about... Uh, just busting out of the last two years of the same old and trying to bring back, or maybe not, not bring back, but just move forward and go like, what I've always enjoyed is spontaneous and getting inspiration around people. And I'm going to a workshop in Vegas held by Alan Weiss, who's my business coach. And we're looking at shedding your old identity and actually deciding who do you want to be? And so he sent us this prep activity where we have to map out who do we want to attract? You know, all those sort of questions that we, we think we answer. I you know I've done a lot of reflection, but to be held accountable and be like, I'm going to go here. I'm going to talk to people and share this. So I think I will have to share what that new identity is with you maybe in about a week's time. <laughs> week's time. So sorry, podcast listeners. But what it is, is I basically want to, at the moment, but with the word facilitator and having a podcast about facilitation, a lot of the time with businesses, I've been working with HR and L&D. And what I want to do in terms of my up-leveling is work side to side with business owners, CEOs, senior leaders, and influence at that level. I found a lot of the time working in running leadership workshops and things like that for middle management, often during the breaks, people would come up and say, this is really great, but the culture doesn't support this or my manager doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I felt, I mean, I really want to make a difference. And, and there's certain things you can do to empower people and to take on that personal responsibility. There's also systemic things within corporations that I would like to see change. And so I need to up-level myself to influence at that level. And would you describe, I wonder whether it's just a taxonomy thing of how, is it something about the word or the role facilitator that isn't allowed to actually sit next to the CEO and bring to, to bring the CEO into the boat of this journey? Because it sounds as if you would continue to do the same word just with a different stamp on your forehead. That's exactly what I'm doing. It's just cha changing the package, <laughs> right? That's all I'm doing, <laughs> changing the tagline. But language, as we know, is so powerful. We've, as facilitators, we pay a lot of attention to it. Facilitators in HR, facilitators in L&D, that's where you sort of put it, as opposed to strategic management consultant. You know, where do you put that position or that role? I'm not, I don't think I'll call myself that. That's a bit too corporate for me. I'm trying to figure out what that cool word is that will still put me side by side, someone in the C-suite. But it's, 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 it's a branding. It, it's purely branding. You're absolutely right, Miriam. In terms of my skill set and the way that I've up-leveled the technical side of things, yeah, I'm doing a lot of reading and learning and growth that side. But more importantly, it's the positioning. Where am I playing on the chessboard? Like what's and what content am I putting out to create a new perception? Yeah. 
A simple deck of cards can be a brilliant way to engage a group. You can use them to stimulate thought, inject energy or spark lively conversations. But how can you use cards when you're facilitating virtually? Deckhive.com is a brand new platform that enables you to use cards on screen just as you would face to face. Invite people to a shared real-time session and then let them select, move and flip cards over. Our growing library includes many popular card decks, including picture cards, strengths cards, emotion cards and more. But if we don't have what you need, you can even create your own deck really easily. Use the code WORKSHOPSWORK when you subscribe to a paid monthly plan and you'll get the first month completely free. Go to deckhive.com and give it a try. And I think what uh, confidence you're bringing also to the space, because when you're working side by side with the sea suit, you do need a different level of confidence and pushing back and asking for permission of trust. Okay, so now you listen. This is how are we going to run it? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. And, uh, and Alan Weiss, one of my favorite lines that he teaches is to say, let me tell you how I work. And rather than being, you know, given the agenda or it's like, okay, this is the problem, let's work through it and let me tell you now how I'll help you. So that, that's, I mean, language and that shift in yeah. it, the, the body language, how you communicate that, I'm not even there yet. I'm right at the beginning of this journey, I think, and that level of imposter syndrome where you think, oh, well, if they're in senior roles and they got to this level, they must know everything. But what I've, what I've discovered through a lot of conversations and working with people is, they're so good at what they do in terms of the company and the operational and technical side of things, but the people and culture side of things, things that we take for granted because we know we do it every day, that's not high on their agenda. So that's, yeah, that's the help and value that we can bring as facilitators. Yeah. Together with the acknowledgement that, or the knowledge of the inner game and the importance of the inner game. I think as facilitators, similar to coaches, we spend so much time working on our mindset and being aware of, as you said, how our language impacts our surrounding. And it's that that we can bring to the table working with different groups. And the hard part, Miriam, is that because we live it every day and we do it, we don't recognize the value in it. That's the hard part. It's things that we think are obvious in a group setting, other people may not pick up. But that's, yeah, and so, and so in terms of like monetizing that value, it's hard to do because you think, oh, well, every, everyone sees this or everyone knows this. And it's surprising how few people do. That's a filter bubble, right? We, yeah, we Especially right. as a, you also, you, you build the community of facilitators. You have your Facebook groups. You interview 200 facilitators. Both of us, we're surrounding ourselves with these people. So, of course, we have the impression that everyone is like that because exactly. we rarely speak to normal people (laughs) exactly and the problem was can I tell you this I was also like going to these networking events with other consultants and other speakers and other trainers and facilitators and I was wondering why I didn't get business it's like hello Leanne start pop start being the novelty and go to other events like industry events where people are actually where the facilitator or the leadership coach is a novelty there so I mean just even if you think about that like your filter bubble Yes, I agree. Build a community, hang around with people that can cheer you on because it is a very lone profession and we do get lonely. But also in terms of the marketing efforts, it's like, yeah, like we are very valuable everywhere mm. else outside our filter bubble. It makes so much sense. Yeah. To really consciously choose where do we hang out and with what purpose. So when we're in our facilitation community, we learn from each other. It's this peer learning. It's this inner growth. It's um, sharpening our skills, reflecting on how we do things. But it's not for, if we want to grow our business, we have to leave this bubble and, yeah, show what we can do. And I think it's also good for our self-confidence, actually. Because what I realize when I hang out with normal people, they really appreciate the skill of just not interrupting and listening with the full body and listening to what's not said and... um, reflecting back and synthesizing what they said right that's highly appreciated in normal life <laughs> it is and and by, like you said when we, when we hang around fellow facilitators it's like the best conversation because everyone's very mindful of when people can pop in but that's not necessarily what the real world reflects yeah one thing that i have observed from the sidelines you're doing with um 
experimenting more and more with facilitating conversations without camera. Yes. <laughs> and you briefly mentioned the body language when you talked about your new role. And yeah, what is the role actually of body language in a conversation when facilitating it? And what do you have to keep in mind when you take this away? Well, it's funny you said, yeah, you watch me on the sidelines. So I pretty much follow every new fad and trend. So when Clubhouse came aboard, I think it was, yeah, it was over 12 months ago now. I was like one of the, like an early adopter on Clubhouse. And I spent a lot of time just being curious around how are these rooms being run? And I jumped into rooms that were run poorly and rooms that were run really well. And I thought, well, what's the difference here? And there were, I guess, it, it was such an interesting time because people were jumping on board and, and it's called moderation in Clubhouse. The role is a little bit mm -hmm. different. But if you're looking ahead now to all of the technology platforms, Twitter spaces is a big thing. It's audio only. That's growing a lot. Discord is where the whole Web 3.0 NFT world hangs out. They're all talking on voice as well. So, but when I think about it, Miriam, it's not actually new, right? So there's a few things. Number one, my first job was for Accenture back in what, 2007, And we were just doing web conference, uh, you know, phone teleconferencing where you dial in, it bleeps. So we've been doing it all along. It's just kind of bringing it back and maybe making it a bit better. In Australia as well, there's something called School of the Air. Have mm -hmm. you heard of that? Is it for the remote farms uh, where they go to school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so for decades. Before uh, the internet. Before the internet, people have been learning through the power of audio. And if anyone's listening to this podcast, and Miriam, and Miriam, if they've been listening to many of your episodes, I'm sure they could meet you and you, you would be best friends. So there is insane power in audio in terms of your ability to develop rapport and build a relationship because once you lose all the other senses and you only have the sound of someone's voice, there is so much truth that comes across. My friend Ronsley Vaz, he runs an audio agency and he said, he goes, it's very easy to tell whether someone is authentic or not just by tuning in. There's a, some depth of, of listening and you've had Oscar Trimboli on your show as well. So I think there's immense power in it. And for, for many different reasons, one, even today, just recency effect. I, I had an MS Teams call scheduled with a client and they were running late. So we thought, oh, she'll just give me a call. So it's like a 30 minute meeting. She gave me a call. We were done in five minutes on audio. For some reason, I don't know if you find this, but when I hop on a video call, there just seems to be some temptation to like extend it out to, I, I imagine if we were on Teams, we would have spoken for 30 minutes. But audio, it's, I don't know, there's something about speed and movement perhaps. I, I, it's just based on, on my experience today. I've got a lot to say about it, but I don't know, I'm, I'm being very broad here. Interesting. And I, I'm, still, <laughs> lot I'm still processing. <laughs> I'm still processing um, all the different layers, especially the last one. Why is it that it, we tend to extend and expand? Maybe because we want to process all the additional information that is happening, and this just takes time. So if I have only your voice, that's what I will pay attention to, and then I got everything I needed. If I see yeah, you, I maybe my brain has FOMO, okay? Maybe there was something to explore. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's also like usually when I'm on the telephone and with AirPods in, I'm I'm doing something else. Like I could be walking around and I, mm. I usually I'm personally not very good at standing still. So when I'm in a Zoom call and I'm sort of seated at my computer, I'm stationary. Inertia kind of rings mm. in, right? Inertia. I'll just stay here. But on the phone, you're kind of moving and I, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's quite interesting. But so that, that's, that was just something for, I just observed today. I was like, oh, that was interesting, that, that call. Yeah we got it done yet I imagine teams would have been different because it usually is and it usually goes over for some reason as well because we have such a good time <laughs> I will investigate on that and actually there's another data point that confirms your hypothesis Ooh. so n equals the, two excellent <laughs> yeah at the um, at the never done before community we recently started to use coffee chat it's I think the coolest app that I came around in the last year maybe two years it's It's a virtual coffee machine where you can invite your groups and then it's a time box, seven minutes conversation, video conversation. So you put the time, whenever you walk to the coffee machine, so you use the app, you say, okay, I'm at the coffee machine for the next 15, 30, 60 minutes. And then 
the others in your group get a little notification. Miriam is at the coffee machine. Do you want to meet her? And then they click the button. And for seven, min seven minutes sharp, you have a video call. And this is usually for me the opportunity to get up my chair, to walk around, to have a real coffee and to have this short conversation with someone. And in seven minutes, you can get everything done, but you're not sitting in front of the desk. Yeah. You're yeah, I don't know if it's my compulsion. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I don't know if it's inertia or it's my compulsion to multitask and just like get the most out of every minute. <laughs> but I, I just, there's something casual about it as well. And sometimes like when my calendar is full and someone will want to get in and, and have a chat, I'll say, oh, why don't we do a walk and talk? And mm. there's something beautiful and relaxing. And I, I had a chat with one of our mutual friends, Jimbo, in Taiwan. Mm. And oh, so he yeah. was out walking his dog. I was out walking my dog. And it was just joyous just to be untethered to yeah. the room. So th there's some joy in it as well. But it'd be interesting to talk about. So that's at a one-to-one -one level. I think we all know how great the phone is. The, the curious and interesting part is when you get like, you know, a mass of people in one of these audio rooms and you're like, well, what is going on here? How are people moderating this and self-moderating? Yes. Thank you for bringing it back because this would have been the next layer to explore. <laughs> the clubhouse. I spent a little bit of time there in the beginning out of curiosity. And I was very curious, as you mentioned, what is it that makes some rooms work and others not? What makes a good clubhouse moderator? So I gave up. Tell me, what did you find out? I wish I gave up too, because I would have done a lot more with my life if I had given up 12 months ago. There's a lot of time that I was spent there. What I, I think it's the structure of it. So what we're talking about is, oh, it's an audio platform, but what I discovered where there are different structures within it. So one could be, you know, they had an expert could be on stage, on stage in sort of inverted commas. Then you could have the facilitated panel. So you have the MC and you've got three experts up on stage doing Q&A. Then you could just do pure Q&A where it's just people at the same level jumping in and just having a conversation so within audio, there's actually like all the different layers that we'd have, you know, on a stage as well. But the good rooms had set that intention. And much mm -hmm. like a, a rate, what's weird about Clubhouse as well is that you can jump in at any time. So I could jump into a room that it had been running for 30 minutes. The best rooms are the ones where sort of every few minutes that I'd actually go back and talk about the intentionality and the purpose, like any great facilitator would. Mm -hmm. right. Welcome back to the room. We're here to talk about X, Y, Z. If you'd like to ask a question, so set the roles very quickly. So I think it, they brought in a lot of if good radio hosts that sort of remember to do that. Purpose, intentionality, but that stuff just doesn't change across facilitation. It doesn't matter what medium that you're in. Makes so much and sense. I think the what's interesting about Clubhouse, which is a step above just the normal teleconference, was there was a bit of nonverbal body language in that people could raise hands. There was, you could applaud by click clicking a button and things. So show that you were getting some type of response rather than radio silence. You were kind of seeing that, oh, people are engaged here. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to follow. It is, especially if it's, and we're talking about communication behaviors of non-facilitators. And I think in on a platform like Clubhouse, where you don't know who's entering the room, anyone can enter at any time, and you don't see the body language, then how do you set these rules of not interrupting, not taking too much space, how to intentionally interrupt and to guide, moderate the conversation? Um, I think you just brought up like the uh, word that I just said, interrupt, was is key. And I think the the general feel of the culture of Clubhouse and with all of these spaces that have been developed since is that when you jump into a room, you kind of just linger around a bit and wait. You wait and you get a sense of what the room is all about. And you can pretty much pick up on that sense in the first five minutes. So if someone is talking and they're going off track and the moderator interrupts, you know that this is, okay, great. This is going to be on purpose and on point. If you are in that space of five minutes, you hear three or four different voices, you go, all right, this might be an inclusive environment. I might feel safe to jump in here. Whereas the opposite experience was had, you know, jumping into a room, there was a five minute monologue. It's not on topic. Very quickly, I'd leave that room. So, and this isn't, again, I have not researched this, but this is my perception of the experience. My, my goal was for about a month, just listen to rooms and see what's going on and then, right, get on stage and mm -hmm. give moderating a crack. Interesting. I was just trying to imagine how this would happen in the physical space. So what are the clues that you get if you step into a room, imagine a, a conference, an open space kind of platform, because at the end of the day, 
clubhouse is a little bit like open space and you have fish bowls or panel conversations or whatsoever. <laughs> so you walk into a room, how do you get that grip? If you have physical Water. clues, is it how the space is, maybe how the chairs are put? I think it's every sense that we have access to. So it'll be the, even the audio level that you sense, like the, the body language, the movement, is it up or is it low? Are people close or are they far away? I mean, social distancing kind of prohibits that. There's so many signals within that. If you look over, is, does it look like one person is in charge or does it seem more democratized? Who has access to the microphone? How many microphones do you have to have to stand up and to walk to the microphone or is someone bringing the microphone to you? Are you sitting in a circle or in rows with someone on stage? Do you have a stage? How many chairs do you have on the stage? Are there any chairs on the stage? What are they wearing? <laughs> yeah. What language do they speak? Like there's so much and it's all, but of course our brain will subconsciously go through this in like half a second and make us and go, yeah, that's a safe place to enter or no, I'm, I'm not going in there. So I think it's a lot faster with those, those visual yeah. environmental cues. And it seems as if it's um, even more democratic. I already found that a video conference is more democratic than an in-space, in-space, on-site, mm. because mm. you you don't have to have the courage to stand up and to walk and to to take all the space in which some people feel more comfortable than others. And it seems almost as if audio is even more democratic because the only thing that counts is the content that comes out of your mouth, full stop. Yeah, absolutely. It's the content, but also your delivery and your intonation And mm. I can tell I'm a member of uh, this sort of community and every month they release these calls and they're in New York. So I don't get to wake up at 4am every day to, you know, to jump on the call. But I formed an impression of who all these people are, not really based on what they're saying, but how they're saying it. So I can tell someone's confidence level. I can tell what they might be like just based on their voice. And I think it's funny with even having a podcast and certain guests, some people resonate with different voices and I wonder if the guests if it, two guests said the same message but they had different voices on that I imagine people would still be pulled towards one or the other person like because the speed like you know our pace if you look at even you and I we have dramatically different shows about the same topic because of who like our voice right like yeah. you can the, the pace and all of that it's so, I mean, even some rooms I join where it's just like, oh, like I, the voice kind of, like people get irritated or they like it. And you can tell pretty quickly. Yeah. 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 It's the voice and it's also the way how you guide conversation, facilitate it, moderate it, which brings us back to what facilitation means is basically we were all doing the same stuff in the room, right? I mean, none of us has invented even liberating <laughs> structures. Yes, they put it into a structure, But at the end of the day, it's something we've done already intuitively. And still, we're all different. And doing the same exercise with the groups, with some groups and some facilitators, it works. And sometimes it doesn't. And some like one style, some the other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, Please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.